Hello everybody and welcome to Dining for Women's Google Hangout for this month. I hope you're, you are all having a great summer. Today I have two guests with me. First I have Amy who is Dining for Women's Donor and Data Associate. Hi Amy. Hi Veena. Hello. I also have Elizabeth Schultes who is the co-founder of Ashraya Initiative for Children. Ashraya Initiative for Children was founded in the year 2005 in the city of Pune in, on the west coast of India. So Elizabeth, why don't you go ahead and say hello first to all of us and then go ahead and tell us about your program. Hi everyone, hello. Um, I'm going to be telling you a little bit today about um, the Trailblazing Girls Project. Sorry. Right, let me, here we go. Okay. So the Trailblazing Girls Project uh, is uh, something that we're going to be implementing beginning this year over the course of the next two years with support for dining, uh, dining for women. Uh, the organization that I founded, AIC, uh, Ashray Initiative for Children, works with two communities that are known in India as denotified tribes. Uh, this basically means that when the British were in India as colonial powers, they legally branded these communities as criminal by birth. So every member of these communities was considered to be a criminal. We work with two communities, uh, the Wagri and the Sikli, the Wagri people and the Sikli people, and uh, we basically have 200 students, male and female. So it's about 110 girls in our uh, in our education outreach program. In 2015, AIC wrapped up what we called the Moti Mulgi pilot project. Moti Mulgi basically means big girls or older girls. And the point of this project was to uh, essentially prevent any of our older girls from dropping out of school and, and of the, the AIC education program. Uh, in previous years, we had been very concerned to see num you know, a significant number of girls being pulled out either to get married uh, as soon as they hit adolescence or dropping out of school because their families and communities weren't supportive. So uh, with you know, increased communication between counselors and, and teachers and administrators and uh, maximized resource investment uh, on girls ages between uh, the ages of about 13 and 16, uh, we were successful in retaining 100% of the girls um, in our program, the year of the pilot program. This led the way for the Trailblazing Girls Project. Um, which we're very excited about. And there are four main goals of the Trailblazing Girls Project. Uh, the first is uh, improved educational outcomes because this is run uh, as a part of our, uh, AIC's education outreach program, so academic outcomes are quite important to us. Um, promoting opportunities for self-expression and empowerment, uh, paving the way for eventual economic self-sufficiency of of the girls in these communities, and facilitating more supportive home and community environments. Uh, so our first goal, improved educational outcomes. Uh, many of the girls in our program struggle, um, especially because a, a lot of them go to government schools that are, you know, not terribly, not terribly ro robust academic environments, um, and. A lot of the girls uh, feel ashamed or embarrassed to raise their hand, ask questions. Uh, they don't have the self-confidence to do that. So one of the things that we're very excited about is uh, that this, the Trailblazing Girls Project will provide two remedial teachers uh, to help the girls in our program who have really been struggling and to make sure that they don't fall through the cracks and give them some individual, individualized support. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, we also have a number of girls who have been identified as um, being exceptionally promising in terms of um, sort of future, future opportunities. And we work with several schools uh, that offer international level education, um, and we would like to be able to uh, prepare these, these girls for you know, taking entrance exams and some of these competitive admission proce admissions processes. 
So this, uh, this will also provide that additional support. And um, it, will, it, will, it will also provide a college counselor, which is important because, you know, these girls don't have, um, they don't have role models within their communities. They don't have, uh, there are no adults within their communities who have gone on to had, have careers and things like that. Um, so, so a lot of times they don't really know what kind of interests they should pursue or, or career paths or anything like that. So a college counselor really helps us to individualize the educational journey for our girls. Uh, so the second goal of the Trailblazing Girls Project is to encourage self-expression and empowerment. Uh, we will be doing this uh, with a trained clinical counselor um, who will be doing individual sessions, group sessions, working within classrooms, working to support our teaching staff to ensure that these girls really do have the social and emotional support that they need. Um, and she will also be uh, facilitating the establishment of a girls' leadership body um, and an associated annual retreat so that the girls can go in and, you know, develop some leadership skills, uh, develop some of these peer-to-peer -peer support networks. Um, additionally, we plan to incorporate community exposure uh, into this, uh, this particular component of the Trailblazing Girls Project, mostly because um, these girls really have very few opportunities to get out of their small uh, insular slum communities and thus they really lack exposure to you know places that a lot of people take for granted going to a library or you know walking around a university campus and things like that so this um, you know we're we're really looking forward to being able to expose them to some of these real world scenarios and environments so that they'll have more confidence in the future as they grow up and, and you know, need to, need to have this exposure. Uh, furthermore, uh, we are also uh, planning to expand extracurricular activities um, within the Trailblazing Girls Project. <clears throat> uh, we are looking forward to expanding the extracurricular uh, activities that we offer such that every girl in our program is able to participate in an activity and, and really have these be ongoing, sustained um, opportunities for the girls so that they can actually develop their skills in, in these different areas and not just have a, you know, kind of a, a one-week yoga course or a, you know, a, a two-month art class, something, you know, we, we are really looking forward to having activities that are ongoing over the course of the next two years so that the girls in our program can actually truly develop some of these skills. Um, we uh, also will be having some vacation hobby classes uh, twice a year. There'll be two week long classes during the girls' uh, holidays from school so that they can have the opportunity to you know, explore some of these interests um, and, and really express themselves artistically and through sports and music and, and, and art. The third component um, of this uh, Trailblazing Girls Project is to pave the way for eventual economic self-sufficiency for these girls. Uh, so just this year, uh, we were fortunate enough to open up a computer lab within our education outreach center, uh, which is in the, in the heart of the slums, right where the girls live. Um, however, we have only had a part-time teacher who comes on and off, and so we are very much uh, looking forward to having a full-time computer teacher so that the girls are able to um, have the opportunity for weekly computer classes beginning in grade one and going all the way up, uh, as well as additional time um, you know, after school and any time the computer room is not in use so they can really get some practice and have those, um, those skills with technology that they'll need. Uh, additionally, we... Um, just this year started a project where we had three uh, of our college students who are from these communities. This is, um, this is a girl, Neha, she is a, from the Wagri community, uh, and she is a, a college student. Um, so we provided three paid internship positions for girls in these communities to intern at AIC's Education Outreach Program. 
And the feedback that we got from the interns was that it was a huge success. They felt like they really learned a lot. Um, the girl in pink here, her name is Pooja, uh, and she actually was one of our original 12 girls uh, from 2006. So she's really come a long way and is now a college student. Um, and having this internship program really allows these girls to get their feet wet in a professional environment. And we're, um, we'll be continuing uh, this internship program for the next two years with three interns per year. Uh, this is one of the intern, interns for this coming year. Uh, she was she fled her husband and actually has two children. She was a child bride and she just completed high school um, this this spring, a couple months ago. So she is actually going on to college and will be an intern this year as well. Uh, so the fourth and final goal of the Trailblazing Girls Project is to facilitate more supportive home and community environments. Since we often find that the families of these of these girls are are really not as excited about the idea of their girls graduating from from high school, then going on to college, and then getting a job, uh, as we would like them to be, uh, we plan to host three parental engagement days per year, and also involve parents more in the special events that we hold at the ASC Education Center. The parental engagement days are really opportunities for parents to come and spend time seeing their daughters in academic environments and really for us to showcase their daughters' achievements um, as well and sort of nurture this partnership with the parents. Uh, and we also plan to be partnering with key local stakeholders because many in the surrounding community still view these um, these communities as criminal in nature. And since the girls are particularly marginalized within these communities, you know, this really affects them, and it affects them when they're in a class in a in a government school and the teacher is prejudiced against them and, and is, you know, is treating them differently than other students. So we plan to do public education workshops with um, key local stakeholders, for example, teachers at government schools, police officials, local politicians, and others who really could be instrumental in changing, uh, in changing the way these girls are able to move forward uh, in life. So that's the end of my presentation, um, and I would be happy to take any questions. Uh, Shukriya, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for giving us such a wonderful insight into AIC's programs. Um, so while I wait for you to get back on screen, uh, here's a question for you. Can you elaborate more about the denotified tribes? Who exactly are they? Sure. So um, the denotified tribes are essentially one lump uh, term for uh, hundreds, actually, of communities in India. This is a caste-based um, distinction. And basically what happened is in 1871, under the government of, um, under the British government, um, the decision was made to uh, legally criminalize uh, just at millions and millions and millions of people as, as I said, criminal by birth. And um, many of these communities were either nomadic or semi-nomadic. And it, they sort of didn't fit into the British notion of, you know, how of, of attempting to rule and, and control uh, the, the people of India. And so when people were, you know, not adhering to land ownership laws and they're just sort of, you know, the British saw them basically as wild and wandering, again, to use a, an original quote. Um, and so essentially by branding them as criminals, um, they had a means of controlling them. And many of these communities were literally rounded up and had to live in a specific place. The men had to sort of check in at a certain time at the local police stations. There was, I mean, they were very heavily controlled. Um, so the Wagris and the Sikhligars are two very different communities. Um, the Wagris are originally from Gujarat. Uh, the women go door to door, like in the marketplace, um, kind of selling old cloth scraps. Uh, the men sit on the side of the road and literally whittle um, keys out of pieces of metal. Uh, the Sikhligars are originally from Punjab and uh, basically the women are not in any way permitted to work. Uh, so I, I literally know of only one exception to this rule and she 
is an AIC employee. Um, and the men uh, historically have been iron welders, so they basically sit and uh, do kind of roadside iron work um, over an open flame. Mm -hmm. So, and, and they're very, uh, they're very insular communities. They're, they, they honestly do not interact very much. There is no, you know, marrying outside of your community or anything like that. These communities are also very, very poor. Uh, they, by and large, all live below the poverty line. Um, there's a lot of alcohol abuse, substance abuse. Domestic violence is a huge, huge issue uh, that we face as well. And, and the, the adults are not literate. They're not educated. So they really can't get jobs. Mm -hmm. um, so many of the communities that Dining for Women supports has this history of groups that are, you know, post-colonial, they are still being marginalized and, uh, you know, they're kind of outside mainstream society. So it's extremely impressive to see that AIC has this outreach program and you're able to help these girls um, even while they're mainstreamed into schools. Can you walk us through one story when we have very little time left um, of one of your success stories? You know, tell us, share, share with us. <laughs> of course, it's hard to pick one. Um, I think one that I would would pick is uh, the girl that I had mentioned. Um, her name is Archana. She uh, is is one who's going to be interning with us. Um, she, Archana had been in our program, I mean, she's been in our pro program probably for about eight years now. She grew up in a terribly poor situation, um, abusive father, just a lot of issues. Uh, her family actually got her married off when she was 15. Um, again, a lot of abuse issues within her new, you know, her, her in-law's house. She had, a, she had a child, she fled back to um, back to Yeroda, which is the area we work in, um, back to her parents' house recently, and uh, found out she was pregnant with her second child. And the reason she had fled was because her husband had repeatedly threatened to and actually attempted to kill her. Um, so she, because the sick leader community is so, so, so against women completing their educations, having jobs, working outside of the house, she has faced just incredible... Um, pressure from her community to go back to her husband. Her her own siblings do not speak with her because they're so angry that she's broken tradition. But she has stood up to all of them and basically has raised these two children, has gone on to, she just, we just got her results within the last month that she passed 10th standard. Um, her mother has agreed to let us support her through college. Um, and now she'll be interning and actually, you know, learning skills. She wants to be a teacher, so she's going to be interning in our pre-primary school um, beginning next month. And so she's very excited about that. And we're very excited to see that there can be this beacon, uh, you know, this girl who really does, you know, who really does blaze a trail for future girls in her community. Elizabeth, thank you so much for being part of this Google Hangout. Uh, you know, we have so many, we hear so many little stories like this, like Archana, and it is their grit and your support that helps them get through. So we will be rooting for her, and we will hope to hear more stories when we receive your reports. But for now, yeah. best wishes for a successful program. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, everybody. You. Thank you for joining us for this Google Hangout, and we will be back with you next month. Bye-bye.